talking about about the role of uh, embassies abroad where there are a huge number of migrants from countries of origin so we worked in in uh, jordan bangladesh embassy worked in three levels firstly service secondly security and thirdly repatriation or re return now in terms of service what we did was the first thing that we did was to engage with the recruitment agencies and also the employers sometimes individually and sometimes in a group to do two things one is to raise awareness among the workers about uh, the how to protect themselves and also asking the employers and also the recruitment agencies to ensure all the rights and also hygiene and sanitation and healthcare for all the workers uh, from Bangladesh in Jordan. And secondly, in terms of security, we engaged with the stakeholders, the stakeholders that was mentioned by the moderator, to ensure the job security of uh, the workers as much as possible within the law of the country of destination as well as the country of origin and also within the contracts that the um, workers have. And um, also uh, other uh, security issues that we tried to engage. And uh, I missed another thing that is uh, under the service sector, what we did was we identified the most vulnerable group among the migrants who needed some help and we tried to distribute, not tried, we did distribute uh, some food items and some other items uh, to the vul most vulnerable and most destitute migrant workers that came from Bangladesh and Jordan. And uh, we have seen that other Bangladesh embassies around the world did the same thing. And thirdly, on repatriation, those who are willing to go back and those who need to go back uh, to the country of origin, that is to Bangladesh, we facilitated their repatriation. And in that also, we are uh, very much uh, engaged with the um, employers here, because as per contract, the employers are responsible for return of the workers when they want to go back to their country of origin. So we uh, just generated uh, work on that regard as per the contract and also as per the law. And we engaged for the repatriation of Bangladeshis, those who want to go back to Bangladesh during this time. Now, if you look at uh, the very recent, I think as, as recent as yesterday, uh, the WHO's um, prediction, uh, that uh, the COVID uh, virus is not going to go away very soon. So we have to think about, um, a, you know, a, I think a bit of a long-term um, situation and what can be done. And here, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, listened to the, uh, to the moderator uh, talking about uh, the return and the, how to uh, reinitiate the circulation of the international migration again because uh, we now are seeing a lot of travel barriers a lot of uh, airports are closed uh, but uh, the the thing is that it is also harming uh, both the economy of the country of destination as well as the country of origin and above all the migrants themselves if uh, the circulation of migration is barred so we are trying to also engage with the other stakeholders, the relevant stakeholders in the country of uh, destination to see how we can uh, restart the circulation of migration. A number of people have gone back, but I hear from the recruitment agencies as, as, early, uh, as recent as yesterday, I had a meeting with the recruitment agencies here in Jordan, and we were talking about the difficulties they are facing. It's not only the recruitment agencies, but basically it is the employers, the factories, uh, the different sectors where they uh, uh, recruit um, foreign workers or migrant workers. And they are facing a big challenge in that because a lot of migrant workers who have been recruited cannot come and also they cannot recruit anymore, but there are vacancies in number of areas and sectors. So they are also taking a look at it. And here we are uh, trying to engage with the relevant stakeholders to see how we can uh, start the uh, circulation process again. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the challenges. Uh, William mentioned that there are a huge number of challenges. Now, uh, in terms of challenges, let me, uh, I have chalked down listening to you too. Uh, one thing is, I think that uh, one challenge, which, is, which has not been very evident in Jordan, but I know around the world, we see this a big challenge, the stigma that is going against the um, 
migrant workers around the world. Uh, it is everywhere. Uh, so that is a big challenge, I would say, uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, secondly, a uh, big challenge that we faced in uh, Jordan as well, the, the communication challenge or the awareness among the migrants themselves that, that they need to immediately um, consult or communicate uh, with their uh, missions if there is a mission uh, in, in, in that uh, country of destination. Like here, we found a number of uh, migrant workers who were not communicating with us, but we then we needed to outreach a little bit more that imposes a little more challenge on the side of the embassy, which has a very small uh, capacity, which has very small uh, resources. The second thing, I think uh, one of the um, biggest challenge, I would say absence of any international cooperation or any regional cooperation and I would say a big absence of the United Nations agencies, which I have faced in Jordan, and I'm sure that uh, there are many other countries uh, of origin when we are sitting in another country, uh, we face it uh, during this time, at least with the COVID-19 situation. I would say that I have seen a big uh, gap in there uh, in terms of the presence of the United Nations. A big absence and all of this, I, I would say that there is a big absence of a mechanism that can address uh, the uh, vulnerabilities and also the difficulties of migrants uh, around the world uh, in, terms, uh, in times of crisis. There was one very small mechanism that um, came out uh, from the GFMD quite some time back. It was launched, I think, in uh, 2014. Yeah. Uh, but as far as I know that it has ended in the, the scope of that uh, MIKIC was uh, till 2019. So we do not see any that kind of me me mechanism whereby we can address internationally the situation of migrant workers in a crisis time. There is nothing in the global compact on migration on the uh, emergency situation and uh, there is um, nothing much in the SDGs even. Um, in that regard, I would like to refer in a very few days ago, uh, there was another webinar where I heard uh, Ambassador Shahidul Haq, the former foreign secretary, talking about um, uh, thinking of a new, new mechanism. So that is something we need to take a look at. It. Now, you see, migration has always been a, a, a topic, an action a situation where we always need two to tango. So, the countries of origin or their embassies cannot do anything alone to serve the interest of the migrants around the world if we do not have the cooperation of the countries of the destination and also if there is not a global platform or mechanism globally which is an international on international cooperation in this regard i think this situation now that has made it a bigger challenge for any of the countries of, of origin uh, is, is that absence of that kind of international cooperation mechanism. We do not see any, uh, not global, but not even regional. Um, I would say that I, I tried a little bit to talk to about the other uh, countries of origins from our region, which belong uh, to- uh, Just uh, half a minute left, thank you. Yeah, I'll take this half a minute and uh, just to mention that I, I tried to reach out to the members of the Colombo process who are in Jordan, but I didn't see much of that in that regard. So there is no regional uh, understanding of cooperation, no global understanding of cooperation, and we need to work on it. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we have the next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Thomas Matthew, eminent social worker who is based in Kuwait. Mr. Matthew. Certainly, John Mukher, Mike. Okay, can you hear uh, hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, I I have to uh, say thanks uh, to the organizers, uh, uh, Migrant Forum Asia, uh, GRF uh, DT and uh, CCRM for organizing this kind of uh, uh, virtual seminar on migration. So here, uh, very eminent uh, uh, excellencies are there. 
uh, who are dealing daily uh, with uh, migrant issues and also uh, very uh, uh, CSO uh, level uh, workers. They are also very much engaged with uh, migrants' uh, safety and uh, uh, security of the migrants and uh, they are advocating for uh, their welfare. So they are also here in this panel. So all are well based in the, in the issue of uh, migration. And uh, uh, of course, I, I have to thank one again, once again for the organizers uh, to, uh, uh, to invite me for this kind of uh, uh, seminar, wherein I am only a, a migrant uh, uh, worker, a grassroots level uh, worker, I can say. So I am being invited and it is, uh, I, I think it is a honor uh, given to me. Uh, let me come to the, uh, the, uh, the points uh, which, uh, which are raised. So, Mr. William has very rightly pointed out uh, certain uh, uh, things. I uh, endorse fully uh, with uh, what he has uh, already uh, spoken about. Uh, regarding uh, the issues uh, which we are, uh, as migrants, we are facing, uh, it is a uh, number of normal um, uh, problems are there. And it is uh, long, uh, long ever since it, the problems are highlighted, these are uh, discussed uh, th uh, threadbare. And uh, since uh, 2016, uh, we all know that uh, the uh, SDG, under the SDG uh, goals, uh, global compact was uh, initiated. The discussions were uh, initiated and uh, the global compact became a reality in 2018, December. So it was a Magna Carta, we can say, uh, regarding uh, the migrants. Uh, this is the, is a, it is actually it's a Magna Carta for the migrants. And uh, so now slowly uh, the nations started thinking about it, uh, discussing about it, uh, discourses were going on. And that is the time uh, regarding the implementation side, that is the time this uh, COVID has happened. Uh, this is a sad uh, situation we all know. And the, the highly impacted people, the most vulnerable people, because the, the uh, migrants are the most vulnerable, and among the most vulnerable are the, uh, the migrant uh, uh, women as well as uh, children. They are the most vulnerable in, in this uh, COVID-19 also. And uh, coming to that one, uh, the implementation of these SDG goals is the, is the, is the, um, uh, the one uh, panacea what we can um, uh, ask for all the global um, community uh, to adhere to. This is the time we have to push for uh, the implementation of the uh, uh, global compact in its full sense. There are certain uh, lacunas as uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Nahida Shoban has already uh, pointed out that uh, this is not addressing the crisis conditions. Yes, we know that it is not addressing the crisis conditions. But that that we can definitely we can do. But uh, the, the 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 cooperation of the the nations was lacking in this uh, uh, um, global crisis condition, and this was very badly impacted uh, the the migrants. We know that uh, right from uh, the Donald Trump to any other uh, uh, leaders, they have not come together in one platform to uh, to contain this one and to defeat this uh, COVID. They were all taking the politics uh, and, the, and, and the very badly this one has affected the migrants. So as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Daniel Sassab already uh, pointed out, uh, we have to have a medium term plan, uh, short term plan and the long term plan. Yes, we have all these plans together in global compact. So we have all the stakeholders in the migration um, cycle, or in the migration, uh, this thing, they have to work together to see that the once the COVID, post COVID period, the uh, global compact is implemented throughout the world in the, in, the, in the best way, the most effective way. That is the only solution as a migrant worker I am seeing, nothing else. We have, a, we have a weapon, we have something in hand, we have something, a structure in hand already. So why can't we all together um, work together to see that all the nations in the world, especially the country, see, uh, countries of origin as well as countries of destination is uh, implementing this. 
this is the effort all the CSOs as well as uh, the uh, the dip, uh, the diplomats and all the all the countries have to uh, to think about and act upon. This is the uh, need of the hour, and this is the best opportunity, as I am seeing, uh, to implement the uh, GCM in its fullest sense and uh, spirit. And coming to the uh, uh, the, uh, the missions or the uh, embassies in the uh, in this part of world, I am in the in GCC countries. I'm talking about the GCC countries and the Middle East uh, scenario. It is appallingly a very poor performance by these all these embassies. I am not talking about only the India. I am talking about most of the embassies where I checked. I have seen they are not at all proactive. This is a crisis condition. The safety and security of the uh, uh, of the, their people is the first and most foremost thing. For a uh, for an, any embassy, for that matter, but they failed. They haven't come forward to do the service to safeguard the interest of the of the migrant workers. They haven't come forward. They were they were key. I can say they were sitting in their uh, fortresses or uh, the the citadels uh, where they are uh, appointed. Very few, very few uh, embassies have come forward and and uh, to try to do something. Uh, for the, uh, their uh, their uh, poor workers and the migrants, uh, to there there are certain uh, um, um, things uh, when the, in the migrant in the in the COVID situation. Yes, we know, we know that uh, there are many things have happened uh, to the migrants, especially the the salary theft, the salary robbery, or uh, uh, we can say uh, the wage theft. This is a big issue, and. The, the menial level or the uh, the lower level migrant workers, they were already in the problem of uh, not getting the salary in, in, in time. And in addition to that, because of this uh, COVID, uh, this thing, um, they have taken as an advantage, the, uh, the employers as well as uh, uh, the, uh, the authorities concerned. What happened, oh. I, I can say in numerous, in numerous cases of uh, um, uh, uh, salary theft or the uh, wage theft has happened. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matthew. Uh, we have you have about no, half an hour. No, so we have. I have. Uh, I have many things to say, sir. I okay. mean, uh, so the maybe, salary theft is. Maybe one, you can wind up. Wind up in one minute. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, have, it's, it's, a, it's a major issue, and also see you can see in the in the in the in the amnesty here in in the um, in Kuwait it has happened, still. All the all these uh, countries, countries of uh, origin, they were pushing back their uh, their workers. Though you you need not have to come, and uh, here the countries, the Dindakat and the other things, they were pushing the the, uh, the workers. Actually, these workers, the migrants, were in in between uh, in the the old man and the sea, and they were in this uh, in this condition. Nobody wants them. Their countries, their country of origin, they don't want, and the country of uh, destination, they don't want. And the country of destinations, wherever it is possible, they were uh, looted in such a way that wage theft and other things. I am not going into my time is sort of limited. I can talk about uh, hours together regarding these kind of things. So the international community has to come forward. Of course, in the panel, uh, very eminent people are there. Uh, uh, like uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Manish, uh, sorry, Mr. Manish Gupta, he came to Kuwait. He knows about the issues uh, here. I uh, I had a time uh, to talk to him. And he knows, and he was Joint Secretary of uh, the Gulf region. He knows about the issues, and and why? Why? Who is uh, keeping? Who is keeping back to act proactively for the migrants by the, the countries of origin? This is my question. Okay, so uh, Doctor Matthew, we'll, we will we will be coming back to you. you yes, have sir. I, I want I want time because I have many things to say. In, yes, in, uh, no, no, no. I think question the, answer also is there. Yes, yes sir. And the, thank you. Thank uh, you. We'll let's listen to the next speaker uh, and we'll come back to you you have made some very interesting points about the actual performance of the missions and it's all it's all inter of interest it's to a us it's ground, ground okay. reality okay. sir it's a ground reality Can I request, i'm not blaming anybody uh, manish gupta consul general of india who was earlier in the ministry of external affairs and was keen uh, handler uh, of the issues pertaining to the migrant workers and the migrant workers. Manish Gupta. Good evening, sir. Good evening. 
It's very nice, sir, seeing you here in this forum. And so it's a great pleasure for me to connect with all of my former colleagues and the audience today who have joined here for this important meeting, sir. I remember during my former role, I have dealt with some of these issues. And after coming here to Sydney, as we were rightly, William said, and you were also talking about the role of the missions, which has tremendously expanded. In fact, as I see, it's an entirely new paradigm. And just in the interest of time, I would like to confine myself, you know, how I see the challenges for COVID from here and how we try to deal with them as we move forward. This challenge, you know, this crisis, sir, as you have rightly pointed out, is of an entirely different nature. In fact, this is a once in a lifetime crisis. In the living generation, in our generations, probably, we all are facing this for the first time. And I really wish this should be the last also. The challenge is of immense proportions and everybody is overstressed. When we talk about the countries of origin and we talk about the countries of destination, in terms of argument, it looks pretty simple. But the real challenge is the migrant workers remains the most vulnerable. Sitting here in Sydney, one category I would really like to add here because there are a lot of students from the Indian subcontinent here. And in fact, they also come, if you ask me honestly, in the most vulnerable category. And as I see the biggest challenges, you know, because we all have the countries of origin have a huge migrant diaspora in the countries of destination. So in a crisis like this, sending them back home in a short moment of time, short span of time, is not very easy. In fact, this entire operation is a, a scale of immense proportions. And two things from here I've really realized, which as a whole in the ministry also we have done well is number one, the use of technology, creating centralized portals where you have the databases, databases of the people readily available with us whom we need to transport back to the country. And second thing is gearing the consular wings into an entirely different format because they have to work on rotational basis. They are, as you pointed out, they are real genuine COVID concerns because a single case in any mission probably would take it out of the equation for next 40 to 48 to 72 hours. And here timing is really of the essence. And second challenge that I've seen is how you effectively communicate with your own people who are suffering. And there I think the presence of the social media really that matters the most. We have to be active on Twitter and Facebook on a 24 seven basis. I know some of our Thomas and others are sitting here, but we have to understand the entire thing in a proper perspective. The social media at least gives the mission, the feedback, how the things are going and what we need to plan. And in this crisis time, the biggest challenge that we are facing is getting the approvals from the host countries also, where the people are living right. It's not easy. And second thing, one important role which we all have entered into, you know, even the medical screening of our own people. Sending them back is really easier said than done, but getting them medically screened, putting them on the chartered flight or the special flights or the government flights, it takes human, tremendous amount of resources. So what the government of India has done, the one day Bharat mission we have talked about, almost we have transported as of now when we speak close to 650,000 Indians back home in a short span of 60 days. So overall it's not a, it's a huge achievement and we all are working towards it. We have, as we move forward, we are adding more and more charter flights, just ensuring point to point connectivity. And lastly, when it comes to students, they are the most in a very challenging field because the classes have shifted online. In countries like Australia, the students a lot depend also on the jobs, part-time jobs, which they are permitted to do here. The job scene has gone bust. So in fact, they are living here on the savings or the remittances that they are getting from their families. So for them, it's a real crisis situation. And even those who are well, you know, they really need emotional support, counseling, 
from time to time really and when i say it, i really mean it on a 24/7 basis otherwise we will see many untoward incidents because this is the generation you know which is not very mentally strong to tackle the challenges because they are also seeing it for the first time so they need to be given special attention and lastly one category of people whom i really would like to thank the diaspora organization earlier also i have always been a firm believer you are our force multiplier you are our eyes and ears on the ground the feedback we get from you really helps us to take the issues with the countries where we are in and secondly one thing we should also realize you know when foreign missions like us we are here we have also identified some new ways working with the governments most of the times i think my, my other colleagues are also there we just keep the foreign offices informed meanwhile we work directly with the stakeholders to ensure things go smoothly if i have to work the with the ministry of interior if i have to work with the border forces if i have to work with the ministry of health i will approach them directly to get the things going on for the people on the ground so these are some of the things that i personally see we need to do and moving forward as uh, ambassador sobhan was saying you know getting these people back again to these countries it's also go not going to be very very easy because you need visa permissions approvals and they are not going to come till we find a medicine a vaccine or a standard operating procedure where we can allow these people to come back so i stop here thank you for your patience and i look forward you know if we have any clarification or something i would try like to make an intervention yeah. later thank you okay uh, thank you uh, thank you dr manish uh, gupta uh, i uh, i think you raised some interesting points about social media and uh, approvals from the host country as well as the diaspora role of the diaspora organizations uh, we will of course further deliberate on them uh, before uh, we go to the next panel i just wanted to uh, mention that we have uh, the seventh uh, panelist whose name i inadvertently did not mention in the beginning ms josain noun who is uh, going to speak to us from lebanon will be joining uh, after ambassador Uh, ms samantha jay surya uh, so now uh, can i request uh, ms sumita krishna advocate uh, advocate and solicitor from malaysia uh, forum is yours ma'am thank you sir can you hear me yes thank you uh, thank you to the organizers as well as to the moderator for the opportunity opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic uh, i've been working with many foreign missions in malaysia since 2008 especially on migrant worker issues especially on um, specifically on immigration labor and criminal cases so my relationship with the foreign missions are not new uh, let me start by saying that uh, the role of the missions became amplified during the covid period because it was a period of uncertainty especially when foreign nationals were forced to stay in a in a foreign country separated from their families back home so it was inevitable for foreign nationals to turn to their missions for assistance so i must point out that missions in malaysia during the covid time uh, did a lot of programs and i would like to uh, like to point out a few things that they did during the covid uh, lockdown in malaysia so i would like to put on record that many migrant sending country missions here in malaysia provided the necessary assistance to their nationals example when the malaysian government didn't provide food aid to foreign nationals during the lockdown there were missions who took on that responsibility and also worked with civil society organizations mine included uh, to provide food aid this was not something that the missions usually do but uh, good to say that they learned fast and they did well secondly the missions also provided the necessary information on their websites and facebook pages to their nationals on updates on travels visa and passport renewals translation of host government circ uh, circulars uh, thirdly we also saw missions coordinating flights for their uh, nationals to fly back home uh, although i must say that some of the charges uh, of the flights were exorbitant a cost that uh, many migrants could not afford um, fourthly consular assistance were also provided in a systematic manner example for those who needed to renew their passports after the lockdowns were were lifted as what william pointed out 
the lack of monetary and human resources are a problem for many Asian missions. But uh, this is something that the government must look into urgently, especially in countries that host a large number of migrants. Um, I would like to also share some instances that I felt the missions could have done better and could have been uh, more proactive. Example, when uh, foreign nationals in Malaysia were arrested during the lo lockdown period and they were exposed to the virus in detention or when the migrants were detained in detention for a prolonged time because of inadequate flights, uh, unclear procedures or the unwillingness of missions to pay for the flights or you know, to coordinate the flights. These are some of the crucial times that we expect and the foreign nationals also expect, the migrants expect, the support of the mission to speak up for them. This didn't happen at all uh, in, in the instances of in Malaysia. Or instances where the migrants lost their jobs when the companies shut down or when the host government revoked approvals for migrants to work in a migrant dominant sector, uh, which also left a, lot of un, uh, which left a lot of documented migrants unemployed or when migrants are hounded by enforcement. Yeah, these are times when we need the missions to stand up, take a stand, dialogue with the host government. Even if you can't publicize the same, you must do this. For me, the, prime, the mission's primary responsibility should be towards their nationals in the host country, then to the host government. Yeah? And in my concluding remarks, I would like, I, I must say that the missions must have dialogues and work together with all stakeholders, including civil society organizations, migrant communities, diaspora, diaspora groups in the host country on how we can move forward post-COVID. And to, to end also to ensure that the rights and protection of vulnerable populations like migrant workers, undoc undocumented migrants, domestic workers, foreign spouses and their children are looked after. This is my concluding remarks. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Sumita. I think you have again made some very, very interesting uh, points uh, and from a different point of view altogether. You know, uh, missions have to uh, be active on the social media and civil society institutions do come forward if a proper dialogue is initiated. Uh, very interesting uh, points. We'll again uh, come back to you. Uh, next uh, speaker, may I request uh, Ms. Samantha Jaisuri, Ambassador of Sri Lanka to Thailand. Uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Mulay. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Mr. Shabri Nair for extending uh, this invitation for us uh, on behalf of uh, the organizers. Particularly a great pleasure to see uh, some of the colleagues whom we have had uh, engagement on uh, migration as well as human rights. And thanks to Migrant Forum Asia, CCRM, uh, GRF TV uh, for this very timely uh, discussion uh, which is very close to our day-to-day uh, -day work and with regard to the Sri Lankan government's ep efforts uh, led by President Gotabe Rajapaksha we had uh, at the very initial stages uh, deployed a COVID task force as in many countries and with the support of uh, the security forces to manage the quarantine procedures as well as the excellent uh, medical teams working on treatment preventive measures and awareness raising. We have recorded uh, a, a good progress, especially with uh, very uh, high recovery rates, uh, something about 80%, and then also very uh, low severity rate. Uh, that's about 0.55%. And having said that, as explained very eloquently by the previous uh, speakers, as the disease started uh, spreading across uh, various parts of the world, the diplomatic missions uh, were among the frontline uh, forces and it was similar for all the 67 uh, missions and posts uh, for Sri Lanka, particularly including uh, the 16 missions which were having dedicated uh, officers to look into the uh, welfare of the migrant workers. And uh, for us, uh, we had like three main uh, functions one on gathering information and data to oversee uh, Sri Lankans uh, and identifying their requirements and, and, and timely reportage to Colombo. 
uh, also involving uh, supporting or giving services to the uh, needy migrants and arranging repatriations. Uh, so in uh, terms of uh, gathering data, uh, we had uh, in the foreign ministry uh, a dedicated focal point and also a web portal called Contact Sri Lanka, which as of date has about uh, over 86,000 entries. Uh, and in parallel, uh, we all in missions uh, started doing uh, the data gathering, which was very important uh, for uh, the government to assess ground situations and identify priorities based on uh, relative vulnerabilities. And as of uh, date, Sri Lanka has about 1.5 million uh, migrant workers, mainly most of them are in the GCC countries. And for us, uh, we have been talking about, we have uh, the importance of whole of government approach. For this uh, COVID uh, crisis, we had our foreign ministry and foreign minister and the minister of uh, foreign employment held by uh, one minister. So it enabled us to have in practice a very pragmatic approach for whole of government. And I think we in the midst of uh, the COVID crisis need to continue this uh, coordination with various stock stakeholders. And also when it comes to supporting the overseas Sri Lankans, I would say it is with a deep sense of respect and salutation to all colleagues uh, serving in missions that uh, they acted beyond a mere duty. And they dem there was abundance uh, in commitment, responsibility and humane gestures. Uh, so they were involved in not only providing the day-to-day -day needs, uh, dry rations as said by the previous uh, speakers, but also on securing uh, jobs and visa extensions, amnesties, even providing uh, alternative shelters uh, where possible. And in our case, we were also uh, involved in making emergency medical uh, evacuations across land borders. Naturally, as uh, Mr. Manish said, most of our missions uh, were working within limited capacities, limited resources. So this was an unprecedented crisis where the capacities had to be rise above to face the unprecedented challenge. And then on repatriation, as of now, we have in Sri Lanka done about uh, 10,000, over, over 10,000 uh, OSLs returned to Sri Lanka, but there are many more registered particularly the migrant uh, workers. But intermittently, the government had to make assessments on the numbers that can be allowed into the country, which was more important in terms of a small developing country where we didn't want to overwhelm the health resources so that this crisis doesn't go outbound. And then uh, the overseas missions, when these intermittent uh, stopping of uh, repatriation was done, there was enormous amount of work that we had to do in engaging uh, the people who have wanting to uh, be repatriated. And at the same time, uh, there were uh, a very difficult priorit prioritization to be done, particularly about the students and then stranded Sri Lankans who have come to the countries on short-term visas and the migrant workers those in irregular situation as well as those who have lost jobs and and also people who had real humanitarian grounds uh, to go back and then it was our responsibility to make very objective and fact-based recommendations regularly to enable the government to make informed decisions so that priorities can be set and also we also uh, were involved in coordinating uh, with faraway destinations where we had Sri Lankans in small numbers so most of the time we were using uh, technology to coordinate remotely to look into their welfare so it was all in all uh, not only providing material support but to give them moral support and confidence to uh, engage with them as regularly as possible uh, that to give them a sense that the embassy is there for to listen to them and to do whatever possible and then uh, 
since we were talking about the role of uh, diplomatic missions during the crisis as well as beyond the crisis, uh, I would like to touch base on some of my thoughts uh, about this aspect. Beyond the crisis, how we would be, we need to be working as missions. I believe uh, in the post. Sorry for intervention. You have about one minute. Thank right. You. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be very, very quick on this. Uh, so there'll be more, uh, more challenges in terms of job cutting as well as using more technology. So we need to help our migrants, especially the uh, semi-skilled migrants, uh, as well as low skill migrants to, to enhance their skills. And also we have to gear up for more specific high quality labor forces. It would be small in numbers but more stronger and sustainable demand to be created. And then uh, just briefly to touch upon uh, about the regional mechanisms, uh, which uh, we would have uh, expected more to be done through such, such uh, regional forums. But uh, for example, we in Colombo process uh, wanted to work on migrant health, uh, but we couldn't achieve that much on those subjects. And particularly, uh, we wanted the Colombo process to be a coordinating point between capitals and Geneva, as well as those destination countries. So this is something which we have to look in the new normal, where we need to have more engagement with all the stakeholders through the regional processes. And as we begin the decade of action for SDGs, these all have to come into play. And I will stop there. But I, I do agree with uh, that better engagement, better transparency, uh, and uh, to see new uh, out of the box innovative mechanisms to find new employments for our migrant workers would be pivotal role that will be vested on most of our missions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I think you again made some very pertinent points not covered uh, by the earlier uh, speakers. Uh, and I'm glad that you highlighted the role of the missions. Uh, these are not very easy times for the missions to handle, uh, you know, because they have not seen something like this in the past. And in the normal circumstances, they face problems. This is a kind of a very, very uh, crisis situation. And yes, some of them do very well. Some of them have difficulties too. Uh, I will now request our uh, last uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Hussain Naun from Lebanon, and she could perhaps also highlight uh, issues pertaining to women, uh, facing women workers uh, facing problems uh, abroad. In addition to uh, whatever she has to say, uh, because this is not adequately covered, I feel, and she might be a good person, uh, right person to comment on this. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hussain Naun. Yes. Uh, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, panel discussion. I'm sorry I will not be able to turn on the video because we are having very bad connection in Lebanon. Um, I want to start with the highlighting on the uh, issue of the process of uh, repatriation in Lebanon, starting with the um, issue of uh, the dollar in Lebanon and that the Lebanese pound has uh, lost 50% of uh, its value comparing to, uh, to US dollar. So technically migrants now uh, are not getting their wages and most of them are not getting their wages and uh, or are getting it in a very low uh, exchange rate. So th the problem is we're, we're going to start with many of them are calling on their embassies to help with the repatriation process. So last month we have a chaotic scene that occurred outside the Bangladesh embassy in Beirut as we had around 400 Bangladeshis attempt to ex uh, expedite the exit uh, visa or to go back to, to, uh, to their country. Uh, we have um, some other problems occurred, for example, uh, uh, such as uh, in front of the Philippine embassy. Uh, workers, undocumented workers, uh, what the Philippine embassy did in Lebanon is that undocumented workers will have to pay uh, fees uh, of their illegal residency, and, but they will be contributing in the ticket fees uh, in the US dollar. Uh, while other embassies and council in Lebanon uh, I'm going to 
I'm gonna say, for example, the Ethiopian embassy, uh, Kenya, we're talking about sorry, a small council in Lebanon. Um, maybe they lack of resources or financial capacities to support migrant workers in the repatriation process to at least cover the penalty fees at the general security or even for the laissez passe and they are even asking for the laissez passe to be paid in US dollar using the exchange rate of the black market. We are facing this issue a lot coming from the councils and embassies who are supposed to be protecting their nationals. And I would like also to highlight on the coordination process that we are really, that is really challenging um, with all embassies and the councils in Lebanon because we don't have any focal point selected by the embassies and council on who to direct or to, to, to talk to in case of any emergency, protection issue, shelter. And even now with the repatriation process, for example, the Ethiopian council was changed uh, like three weeks ago. But until this date, we, we, we weren't able to even contact and to, to, to at least to know how to coordinate for the whole process. And another situation uh, issue is that uh, recently the embassies and councils have released a joint statement with the ILO. I'm not sure if it was with the ILO, but uh, demanding to modify the Fakafala system while us as civil society in Lebanon, the majority of civil society in Lebanon, we are demanding to abolish the Kafala system because it is very, we, we call it the modern sl slavery. And they all know how, uh, how migrants are treated under the Kafala system in Lebanon. And finally, I would like also to highlight on the legal challenges that migrants are facing, that council and embassies have very, um, um, uh, yani small, they, yani they don't interfere or uh, they cannot interfere because maybe they lack of legal capacities, but so we have several migrants who remain in detention centers for months and months just waiting for a ticket fees to be provided by the embassy or the council. And sometimes we go for fundraising campaigns, for any issues, and even sometimes these ladies are pregnant, remaining in detention centers and demanding their council and embassy to pay the fees, but we get no response. So, so I just, I would like to highlight that, of course, some of the embassies and councils, they, they were cooperative, but not, uh, to respond to the needs, especially now with the dollar crisis. And we really need, need to take into consideration that they cannot pay US dollar to all the embassies and councils, especially using the black market uh, uh, rate, which, which is uh, hectic for them and uh, that most of them are now deployed and haven't received their wages. And we need more cooperation and coordination with the civil societies because believe it or not, in Lebanon, we are the one acting and towards really protecting the migrants and making them go home safely. Hello? Yes, audible. Yes. Is audible, please carry on. Yes. So, and uh, also, I would like to best uh, just take it to 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 brief or to uh, to uh, to say um, uh, regarding the Ethiopian migrant workers who are now uh, stranded in front of the council. Now, the new council did a very a good initiative. He reopened the shelter again, and he's now accepting uh, more uh, migrants in the shelters. But the shelter, but the shelter conditions are. Uh, not that good comparing to uh, to how the shelter conditions should be because we know they lack of uh, budget they don't have the capacities but of course they can always coordinate with the civil society we also have the issue of uh, um, the migrant workers they don't know the number uh, of the embassies and council that they can't can contact in case of any emergency or they want to go back to their country. And we have started the repatriation pro process and the documentation of the files who wish to go back to their country since, I'm guessing since April or May, but until the state, okay, so, uh, some of them returned like 10% or 5%, let me say, and most of them were uh, through the Philippine embassy only. 
And but till this date, we are seeing that there is no uh, serious negotiation done with the general security to uh, remove all the penalty fees on uh, migrant and nationals, or at least to contribute. So we need to see a common ground between the civil society, uh, the diplomatic mission, and the government on how we can find a common solution to help these uh, migrant workers go back to their country. And this is it from my side. I will be answering uh, your questions. Uh, I will be I'm glad to answer all of your questions yeah. later. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Josein. I think you have, uh, at the dot eight minute, you have uh, concluded. Thank you so much. You have raised really some very uh, important points about coordination, developing the common ground, particularly the women uh, who are pregnant and you know are stranded. Uh, a lot of this requires further uh, contemplation and deliberation. So uh, thank you so much, panelists. We will be moving uh, to the next part where we uh, intend to have interaction uh, with our uh, participants and uh, some, some very distinguished people. I will be initially calling some of the uh, you know, very distinguished people who are participating. Uh, but before that, let me also note the presence of uh, some uh, very, uh, you know, uh, very, very expert people who are present here uh, for their presence. Uh, Saiful Haq uh, is here. Mehru uh, Vesuwala is here, who was, who was a prominent member of uh, Diaspora. Uh, Sumaya Islam uh, is here. Uh, Nalini Nayak uh, is also here. Mr. Madhavan Kalat is there. Professor Kamla Ganesh uh, has also uh, thought it fit to attend this particular uh, webinar. Uh, Evelyn Tennant, Tennant is uh, here too. Lizzie Joseph, uh, Arvind Francis from FIKI, uh, which is, as you know, the apex body of uh, industry and businesses in India. And uh, Ellen Sana, these are uh, very important uh, participants and I would like to thank them uh, for uh, you know, um, participating and being present at this uh, webinar. Uh, just to begin with, uh, may I request uh, uh, Shahid ul Haq, uh, former Foreign Secretary. Uh, this shows the level of interest that we have uh, in this particular subject and uh, how many people and stakeholders really are uh, interested in knowing uh, what's happening, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the role of missions. So is Mr. Shahid ul Haq, uh, Excellency, can I request you to say a few words or if you have any thoughts quickly, about two minutes. Um, Excellency, I, I am afraid that he has a class at the university, which he okay. needs okay. to leave. Okay. All right. Then we, we have another expert from this time from JNU, uh, Mr. Binod uh, Kadria. Uh, Mr. Kadria, uh, we, we are privileged to have you here. Uh, please do uh, favor us with a comment or two. Um, it was interesting to uh, listen to the different, I would call them case studies of, of countries concerned, uh, including Indian mission in Sydney. Uh, I think most of the things that I have learned about uh, these case studies are about the strategies that have been adopted for troubleshooting. I would call them troubleshooting. But at the same time, what I noticed is uh, one of the speakers uh, uh, thought that the time was limited. I think he has a lot to share with us. And similarly, uh, the uh, ambassador from Bangladesh uh, shared with us her desperate uh, position in terms of absence of cooperation, of including the, the very important point that was flagged was that there is no provision even in the GCM to uh, handle crisis. GCM has 23 objectives after a long drawn persuasion started by Kofi Annan in 2002. It took 16 years to bring all the member countries on board to discuss international migration, which has always been a hot potato. 
uh, because countries, uh, particularly those who are in the diplomatic missions, they would know it better than anybody else that, uh, you know, it is considered kind of an intrusion on the sovereignty of the countries concerned. And this is where um, what I call it equitable adversary analysis. I think this is the right moment, the challenge of COVID to, to go beyond the troubleshooting, which is important, which has to be addressed in any case, to go beyond and use this as an opportunity to raise these issues in the multilateral forum. And I do not have great faith in multilateral forum because multilateral forum, I, I see them as inequitable because uh, countries are global south and the global north are not uh, equipped with similar kind of uh, empowerment that they have. So when it comes to negotiations, I think uh, there is not a level ground, level field is not there. Level playing field is not there. So I think this is the time that you know, we learn from each other. We learn from each other in terms of uh, different time horizons of what we have to address immediately what missions have to uh, you know, take charge in terms of their own population as well as population of other countries because there may not be very strong missions of very small countries in a, in a particular destination country. And that's where perhaps either Indian mission or the Bangladesh mission may be better equipped to handle that. And India has, or other countries have set such examples, particularly at the time of evacuation, even uh, you know, Air India has lifted people from other nationalities. So this is the time. I think the diplomatic missions should, uh, um, you know, step out of their own cocooned areas, sh shed some of their inhibitions uh, in terms of that they, uh, they, they, I think it was being shared here that I think our, our, our Consul General in Sydney himself said that they are directly contacting the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Health, and so on, without referring to the to their masters uh, in back in, in the Indian government, because time is short, and you have to take the action immediately. And that's where I think it's a it's a great deal of learning for ourselves that the missions can draw lessons from this and come together. So this is an opportunity. This kind of forum is an opportunity for you, where you are face to face with public. Because otherwise, there is a barrier. We can't hear you. Okay. We don't hear you. You know. Thank I have, you. I have said this, uh, and just have 15 seconds, I'll say that this, uh, you know, visa issue. I have always addressed that visas. Earlier, we used to go to the missions, and that's where we had a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with the people, uh, <laughs> diplomatic people of those countries. Now it has been outsourced to uh, people of my kind, and so this, I just go and interact with them and shed more money than I used to be, uh, and my alienation uh, goes higher and higher. So these are some of the <laughs> that we need to reflect. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Vinodji. We, ta yeah. we take your point. You I take think you mentioned, point. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned rightly that we have to go beyond, and yes. that going beyond is going to be extremely difficult. I can assure you that. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Farooq Ahmad, Secretary General of the Bangladesh Employers uh, Federation. Uh, if Mr. Farooq Ahmed is there, uh, would you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm available. Okay. Please go ahead and you know give a quick comment. We are really going to run short of time, so I request sure. you to be brief. Sure. Please. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. First of all, uh, it was a very rich discussion, and I'm very delighted to have been able to be present uh, in this discussion. Uh, because of the uh, paucity of time, I'll straight away go to the point. Uh, uh, my first appeal uh, to particularly to the civil society organizations, to the private sector uh, uh, participants, uh, with all my due respect uh, to the government participants, we have to really harp on changing the very perception on philosophy of migration. Migration has mostly been focused from political and economic angle. We have to harp on so that the government realizes and changes perception instead of more giving emphasis, more emphasis on political and economic pers perspective, it should be viewed from the social perspective. So that is the first point that I would like to, I would like to bring so that the subsequent realignment is done from the social perspective instead of political and economic perspective. 
number one. Number two, my request would be to all the stakeholders in the migration governance to have extensive use of technology so that we can have more transparency, more fair, more uh, uh, accurate governance in the whole migration uh, process. And my, my, uh, my number three appeal uh, that we should uh, 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 have more of collaboration and partnership among the various stakeholders uh, 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 in, the, in the migration process. So these are the fundamental issues that I, I wanted to bring in. And uh, thank you so much uh, for the very rich discussion. And I'm happy to see uh, some of my uh, very good friends uh, and also uh, colleagues, uh, particularly our ambassador, uh, <laughs> our elder sister, Ms. Nahida, after a long time, and also uh, William. Thank you so much. Thank you, ambassador. Thank you so much, sir. I think you have again uh, uh, raised some very, very pertinent points of uh, you know, collaboration and civil society's uh, role, which could be very uh, useful and positive. Uh, I have Ambassador Manju Seth here, uh, former Indian ambassador to Madagascar. I want to ask her, rather than uh, you know, uh, giving her a free hand, I want to ask her to speak uh, about uh, women migrant workers and what has been her experience and particularly during uh, the COVID time, what extra measures the mission should be taking uh, to, you know, ameliorate their conditions. Uh, Ambassador Manju Seth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Thora, slightly loudly if you can speak. Good evening. Uh, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure to be here and Ambassador Mule has of course moderated this whole thing so well and it's been a pleasure being here and listening to all the eminent panelists and I think uh, uh, you know I was just uh, you know while, uh, while I was listening to the panelists I was thinking about how women's issues just fall through the uh, through the cracks so to speak you know and people are not able to focus on women's issues at all and uh, maybe I was thinking how can missions be made to focus on the women and ensure that they're the migrants, uh, women migrants, and ensure their um, uh, interests are uh, maintained, especially, you know, when they are, uh, for instance, in the Gulf, uh, many of them, many are documented when they go, especially the maids and domestic workers, uh, they become undocumented. And then now with this COVID, in the times of COVID, uh, they've been absolutely, uh, you know, ignored. Nobody is looking at what is happening to them and how they're affected, and some of them, you know, they're not with their uh, uh, employers, they are living in, in, in small quarters, especially in the Gulf, you know, in small uh, areas living together. So they are very vulnerable and have also, uh, there have been cases where they've been infected, and uh, there is no health care because they've become undocumented. So nobody is even looking at them. Uh, I have a suggestion, uh, I was thinking maybe, uh, you know, missions can uh, uh, enter into a kind of PPP mode, you know, public-private partnership mode, locally, as some of the others have also suggested, and work uh, with uh, local diaspora organizations and augment capacity. Because, uh, you know, for, for Delhi or, or for the headquarters or any other host, uh, you know, governments to augment from, uh, from there and send people and uh, send the money is difficult. But maybe locally, they could uh, augment their capacities through roping in in a PPP kind of mode, in, especially in times of crisis like this. Uh, and um, uh, help uh, migrant workers cope with this uh, unprecedented situation. And similarly in future, you know, in such crises. And I think also that if uh, we can uh, look at women's migration from the point of view of their, uh, from the, you know, their, their um, capacity, their, their skills really, rather than just let everybody go here, you know, go from India also, increase their skills, create, don't let any woman migrant go uh, to work abroad without her being made aware of her rights uh, of her uh, and, and see that she has the skills before she uh, uh, is allowed to migrate. And so, so reskilling, making them aware of their rights so that they're not made uh, fools of, you know, they're, they're denied their salaries and not given any good, um, you know, their, their work conditions are terrible and they are left to their own devices uh, and the missions can't really going to homes and, uh, you know, especially in the Gulf, going to homes where domestic workers' uh, cases are concerned. Uh, similarly, I've also been aware of some nurses, you know, uh, women nurses who have had some problems uh, when they were working abroad. Maybe we should, uh, you know, uh, look at those uh, 
uh, their problems as well, along with yes. the future uh, that we were all crisis. And of, of course, thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, that was very uh, useful. Uh, you have really highlighted some of the dimensions of issues being faced by women migrant workers. Uh, we also have a very distinguished uh, personality who worked with the government in very responsible positions, including former secretary in the external affair uh, in the Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs, uh, Dr. Didar Singh, uh, who is also an expert uh, on migrant issues. Uh, Mr. Didar Singh, would you like to uh, comment on what could be done, which has not been done so far by the missions? You have seen them from the headquarters and you have visited them a number of times. Are you there? Well, Sir, I don't think uh, Mr. Nidhar Singh is there. Nidhar Singh is not there. Then we uh, um, get the what, next uh, yeah. uh, is Veena Swaroop, uh, who is from FIKI. She is present uh, with us. May I request also, her? Yes, also to, left. Veena also, also had left. to leave. Okay, yes. let's uh, thank Mr. her. Mr. Uh, Lakshman Basnet from Sartuk is here. Yeah, okay. And is Mr. K.V. Swami here or we should uh, take uh, him later? Yes, sir, I'm there. I'm here. Okay, so after uh, our, uh, you know, uh, speaker, Mr. Lakshman Basnet, uh, can I request you? So, please, Mr. Lakshman, we would be very happy to uh, hear uh, your brief comments. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mule. Thank you. It's very nice to see you again. I have met you during uh, Colombo process meeting in Kathmandu. I'm from Kathmandu and I work for South Asian Regional Trade Union Council. And uh, as soon as uh, COVID-19 started, Prime Minister of India has said that let the SARC do something about the COVID. And they put some money into, into this process also. Right. But $10 million. That, yeah, but after that, nothing has happened with the SARC. And regarding the GCM, I would like to say, if you go through all 23 objectives, in each of objective, this kind of uh, crisis that is particularly uh, uh, described. Like, you cannot distinguish between the national and uh, uh, migrant in the process of uh, 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 health and social secu securities and other things. But the situation in, in, in GCC countries and Malaysia, Malaysia is out of control. There is no one to give them assurance that we are there to help you. I'm not talking about one government or one uh, embassy. Most of the workers feel that they are helpless and trapped in the country of... I can assure you... Uh, on, on July the 9th, the New York Times wrote a very big article about uh, migrant workers in, uh, in uh, Lebanon, and mostly uh, depicting about the South Asian migrant uh, uh, situation, and especially the women worker from uh, uh, Ethiopia. But it depicts about the people, what they are going through in all of the uh, 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 countries, in GCC countries and Malaysia. So I think uh, it's, it's never too late, but the cooperation is the most important thing. We have to cooperate with, uh, with the countries of, uh, if countries of Colombo process or countries of SARC can come together and discuss with the countries of GCC countries to, to uh, resolve the problems in, in, their, in, in, in GCC country and Malaysia, we would be much better off. I'm not going to say that what embassies or the missions have been doing or not doing, but the workers in the, in the country of uh, uh, destination, they are uh, desperate. And some of the government uh, are not ready to bring them back. 
because they think that uh, um, uh, it is very difficult for them to handle it. It is the right of, uh, right of the migrant workers to come. And the, um, I know the missions are full of migration, migrant workers there. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the diaspora organizations, uh, I, I have nothing to blame them, but uh, they are much more important than the migrant workers. Uh, so I think uh, the first priority should go to the migrant workers to bring them back. And I, some of the um, states uh, of India has doing very well in, 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 in uh, destination countries like government of Kerala is uh, sending some money there or organizations like this individually are doing their food support, telephone, yeah. uh, putting money into telephone. There are a lot of things. But if all the countries uh, of the South Asian region or Colombo process, as you know, Mr. Uh, Mule, you were here in uh, Kathmandu, come together. This problem will much easily uh, through the uh, this uh, uh, GCM we can resolve it. Uh, and this is a very extraordinary uh, situation. So we have to take an extraordinary um, uh, step to resolve yes. our problem. We are the largest. Uh, uh, sending sending uh, migrant sending block in the world to to right. CC countries. Right. Thank you. I, I think Thank my you, time is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate uh, your points. Uh, you know, particularly the emphasis on collaboration and cooperation, and uh, you know, some strong dialogue under Abu Dhabi and. Uh, Colombo process. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll invite uh, Mr. K. V. Swami, Overseas Manpower Corporation of Andhra Pradesh, again, who is directly involved into issues pertaining to migrant labor, migrant workers. Thank you. Dr. Swami. Sir, uh, thank you very much. Sir, the issues and uh, challenges we are facing right now are because of uh, delays uh, in process, like uh, uh, offices have been closed in Kuwait and Muscat, so the candidates could not approach them for quicker uh, redressal or if any issue is there. And second issue we have is like you know, reaching them, uh, reaching the candidates. Since uh, in this pandemic time, uh, the employer is not allowing us to speak to the candidate with the fear that the candidate may leave him or unwanted trouble may come to his home. But in spite of that, uh, we have been putting uh, our best efforts through the non-resident uh, Telugus uh, located there. We are taking their uh, help and reaching them. Embassy has been so busy and all the rescue homes uh, conducted by the embassy are very full. So they are uh, expressing their helplessness also. So the first thing is uh, we need to ensure that they are safe wherever they are. Second thing is like uh, bringing them back here and they are insisting like some COVID test there again and uh, before travel and after travel and tickets. Of course, a lot of issues are there. But uh, we are putting effort, sir. That is my submission. And second thing is, sir, having learned from this, what I have recommend, uh, recommended to the government of India also in future, the pre-departure orientation training should be made mandatory for the women workers. It should be minimum three days to seven days because this is the new uh, learning we have that is hygiene, health, precautions, and some language, where to reach out. So these are the added things. So any woman worker living from India, she should be aware of all these things so that she can be uh, taking care of herself and she can extend care to the uh, children or the old man or the family owner there. So this is what Thank I you. have submitted. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Swami. I think being a man uh, on the ground, your points are absolutely uh, valid. People must get help wherever they are. And of course, that is also a challenge uh, that the governments and the missions uh, particularly face. Uh, I would uh, request uh, Mr. Uh, Rafik uh, Rauter, Center for India Migrant Studies. Uh, Mr. Rafik, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, thanks for this chance because i already wrote some points in chat book and i don't want to blame uh, the mission at this time because we know that as excellency said uh, this is new to them everyone but uh, the saudi mission because start we know the experience of start and we came through a situation like this before so at least the mission could have uh, the saudi mission i am uh, talking about especially about saudi mission could have do something more but uh, the total day we covered so far we it is showing that the mission uh, in saudi was not active like the other missions like uae it was very active and uh, uh, oman was also good and qatar was very tremendous job they did so at least saudi missions could have do because my concern is we came this is new to everyone uh, we cover that situation but we have to document we have to foresee uh, what will happen in tomorrow uh, sir my concern my main concern is i i checked all the uh, repatriation links of india and i found that there is no mention there is no concern about the questions regarding the the workers issue uh, we, we were asking about why this worker is going back what is the priority which priority list she should uh, most there but there is no mention about asking about his wages uh, why he lost job what is his future nothing is there uh, because uh, kerala we received around 80000 workers two days before 80000 workers who lost job and we have big concerns on uh, their future their reintegration we don't have enough fund we know that, state, that our state is working like a a country itself a uh, lot of uh, things we done in between and several missions even the qatar embassy did very supportive for kerala initiative but what happened to this worker my concern is for the future of the worker they are never documented anywhere in the mission anywhere in the history anywhere in the records of the government of india so i am just registering my issue here uh, i think uh, government of india will do uh, government of india will, will address this issue in future like to uh, register their uh, grievances register their issues and do uh, do uh, a, a web portal or something to address their issues a transitional justice mechanism to uh, take up this issue to the destination country thank you very much sir thank you i think uh, <clears throat> again a very relevant point that the documentation and data is not mentioned maybe manish later on you would like to tell about the skill mapping uh, you know briefly uh, that is being done for all the returnees by government of india Uh, in the case of all the repatriations that are happening right now uh, i will request a last uh, you know comment uh, from mehru vesuwala who has been a former uh, diaspora member from bahrain uh, are you there uh, mehru ji in case uh, yes i'm there okay uh, go ahead floor all is right yours. good evening and uh, thank you everyone for this very informative uh, panel and discussion uh, i'd just like to raise a few points i know that uh, the role of the mission is vital and very very important especially during these days and uh, i do feel you know there are issues uh, and normally workers look towards the embassy for redressal of their issues so it is very important for the embassy to take the help of the diaspora and organizations acknowledge their contribution and look at the workers in a little more humane sense there should not be that these people are a burden on us so there are uh, for example in bahrain i was part of the indian missions community outreach prog uh, program called the indian community relief fund it works under the mission the uh, pay the ambassador his excellency the ambassador is the patron and i think that you need to have these very strong partnerships with the community and the diaspora because these days are unprecedented and i it has been pointed out by many of the panelists that uh, the missions are perhaps short staffed and lacking in all the resources though you do have the indian community worker fund i don't know how it is being utilized whether really the fund is being fully utilized towards meeting the day to day and daily needs of the workers 
uh, I'd especially like to point out about the women and the domestic workers particularly. I think they are really in a far more vulnerable and uh, pathetic situation because women, when they leave their employers in the Gulf, they become even more vulnerable. They cannot go back to their employer. They have to have a safe house where they can be kept, looked after, and helped in the repatriation process. Many of the missions do have safe house programs, but many don't and depend upon either the host government or they depend on civil society organizations in the destination country for housing these women. Now, I know in Bahrain, the Indian mission would be using the NGO of the Migrant Workers Protection Society for housing the women who came to the embassy looking for help towards repatriation or the labor issue redressals. But uh, the safe house of the Migrant Workers Protection Society closed down last year. And uh, I don't think there is another safe house other than the government uh, run. Uh, uh, no, no, sir. So I think uh, every I embassy... Mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Sorry? Uh, I don't know whether somebody was trying to talk back to me. But I yeah, think yeah. it's very important that for women, every mission should have their own safe house like there is for uh, in the Philippines, uh, even the Indonesian Nepali government, they all have their own safe house programs because you need to keep the women safe and then you need to work on their repatriation. You cannot send them back to employers again. So I think this point needs to be really addressed very, very seriously because women definitely are the, the most vulnerable and under these pandemic and conditions, I think they are even more, their situation has become even more precarious. I would like to say that having worked with the Indian mission, particularly in the Kingdom of Bahrain, personally, I have to acknowledge the enormous support and cooperation that we did get from the staff. There are challenges for them. I think it is, uh, there are always two sides to a coin. And we need to uh, acknowledge also that the labor staff is largely uh, headed by a labor attaché and under the first secretary labor and uh, the number of staffing is perhaps not enough for the number of Indian diaspora that is there in the GCC countries. Yeah. So I do Thank think you. that uh, uh, just uh, addressing these challenges and maybe going forward the governments not only India but all the other sending country governments need to look at how can we strengthen the labor section of the missions particularly. Right, right. Thank you. I think those were very valid uh, observations uh, and uh, wonderful participation by our uh, expert, uh, you know, participants that have been uh, present with us. I will now quickly uh, take one or two questions uh, and uh, I'll request uh, the, you know, panel experts to comment on them very briefly because we are running short of time. So, uh, Manish, would you like to uh, say something quickly about the skill data mapping of the returnees? Because that's a subject which is uh, really, because ultimately when you come back, you are having no job, no security, you are suddenly landing. And in these difficult situations, you are adding to the unemployment problems that are already there. Sir, so, I will very briefly touch upon the points of the skill mapping of the returnee migrants. In fact, as many of the speakers earlier and uh, some of the people who have asked questions have pointed out the importance of tapping the skills, harnessing them appropriately the, of the returnee migrants. As we always believe, it's important for us as a country to draw the right lessons from any crisis. And as I earlier obliquely referred to the use of technology, a centralized repatriation portal that the government of India set up has worked us tremendously well. It's not only about the demand and supply management with regard to the repatriation operations, but it has also provided us an opportunity to tap the skills of the returnee migrants. Having a database of the returnee migrants skills is extremely important for us to use them for the development of India. And even perhaps, you know, when f there is a future need for migration and these people want to migrate to their own countries of destination, 
probably this would be much more helpful for the foreign employers also. I distinctly sure. recall earlier also through the India Center for Migration, we started the program for the PDO programs also, and we were in the process of developing an app also where we can tap the skills of these migrants, properly register them, and these databases can be seamlessly linked with the destination countries. We started this program with the Saudi and the UAE, where our electronic systems were to be aligned, the e-migrant system with the Saudi e and the and the, and the program for the UAE also. Perhaps we are moving in the right direction. This only thing is how fast we can implement it and put it on a realistic footing. Thank you. Sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, I have a question, uh, which is uh, I would like uh, Dr. Thomas Matthew uh, to respond to. Uh, this is from Lizzie Joseph, uh, who wants to know, uh, is it possible to create a strong network of the stakeholders? And uh, how can we do that? Yes, sir. I mean, yes, uh, Sister Lizzie was, what asked was uh, correct. It is uh, the need of the hour because uh, so many issues, so many problems are there. So different stakeholders in the migration process should be networked together and to, and to find out a way. Uh, they have to sit together, find out a way how to deal with this, uh, these things. It should be there. Uh, when saying all these things, uh, we have to see, I told about, talked about uh, the wage theft and, uh, and the salary theft happening right now. How this can be, uh, these, these workers, they are all contract workers. They are on short term um, basis. So mostly they are on uh, coming on a, a visit visa and all uh, three, three months, five months or one year job and uh, going back. These kind of uh, workers are there. So those kind of workers, they are not, they are, their salaries are not uh, uh, given in this condition. So we have to find a mechanism uh, to compensate properly uh, to these people. Uh, I am uh, experienced about uh, uh, the UN compensation. I was in, in the Iraqi invasion time here in Kuwait and, uh, and I, I was one, we lost everything. I was a refugee and I came back and uh, we, uh, uh, there was uh, some, uh, some compensation mechanism was there. Like that, uh, Mr. Rafiq, a while ago, he was uh, telling about the transitional justice mechanism. So we have to think in terms of that. We have to see that uh, the, the wage theft is not happening. All the, all the contract workers, the migrant workers, uh, the, they should be get their uh, rightful uh, uh, wages and salaries and remunerations, whatever is entitled to them, they should get it. And they have, when they are repatriated, they must be not must not be forcefully repatriated. Nowadays, everything is happening forcefully. It is not repatriation; it is deportation. Most of the uh, have, it is happening. So that should be stopped. We have to see that the post-COVID scenario, wherein this kind of forced repatriation, deportation, and that should not happen. We have to see. We have to find a mechanism. Maybe somebody will say if they say it is not possible. Maybe thinking, but it should happen. We have to work together, a network has to come together to see that this is happening on the ground. Why these regional bodies like uh, Colombo Process and uh, um, uh, Abu Dhabi Dialogue? The dialogue we should not, uh, if the dialogue is continuing, they let it continue. But something on, on the ground, action should be there. So, so we, there, have, uh, we have these two, uh, I think, interesting... Uh, one one more thing, sir, I mean, regarding the conversation side. There are so many workers died because of the COVID here. In this kind of uh, the, this thing, their family, their their earning member is lost, all of a sudden, and these countries, countries of uh, destination, have the have the uh, have the complete responsibility to see that they are co sufficiently compensated. If mm -hmm. a traffic accident or insurance, uh, this thing is happening, uh, there there uh, there is a compensation mechanism. So a compensation mechanism should be there. A sufficient that uh, this thing uh, to be support their families should be uh, done and also the country of origin they have the, uh, the their responsibility they cannot shy away from that even i am talking about if uh, indian india government have have to set apart a fund and give uh, five lakhs or ten lakhs whatever they have to give to the families of these uh, diseased because right. of the covid conditions so right. these are the these are the things there are many other issues very, but very well short, said short of, short, of, short of time i am um, stopping here yes, yes, but yes, the trans yes. transitional justice is one point where we have to see that the worker is uh, is getting their rights their rights that that's all sir thank you okay
Uh, next question is uh, to Ambassador uh, Nashida Soban. Uh, this is uh, about governments of South Asia getting together uh, to work uh, in this particular uh, crisis. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi did uh, interact with all the uh, SAR countries uh, to begin with, and we have set aside some funds also. But there is this question uh, from one of the participants. Can government of South Asia come together? Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Excellency Ambassador Mule. I would say that uh, from Bangladesh side, I know also personally, I, I think that um, South Asian regional countries need to be together on this. It is a journey that we need to do together. And it is possible. As you have rightly mentioned that um, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India did have a talk with the, uh, uh, with the other uh, member countries and also SART member countries and there, there has been a fund activated. I do not know, I do not have the current situation of the fund, how much is, uh, um, uh, how much is uh, collected there and uh, whether any particular mechanism has been set up for the use of the fund. That needs to be seen. What is the mechanism? What is the protocol for the use of that fund and how that can be used? But it is certainly a time where we need to work together, not only in the headquarter, but also in the countries of destinations where we have missions of, from these uh, South Asian countries in the, in the same city when, where we have missions. Um, so uh, I would very much say that we can work together and we should. Uh, if I, uh, I, I have some comments for some of the other comments made. So okay. can I do it now or okay, later? Quickly, yes, quickly go over. Okay, very good. Uh, I see there is uh, some generalized comment about uh, all the missions not doing anything. I would differ on that. And if you listen to Sumitha very uh, correctly, I think she has, she, her, her speech was uh, uh, evident that yes, there are missions that are working and stepped up out of there. I mean, there are a lot of missions from all the countries in the, of South Asian region that have, um, you know, uh, punched over their weight. For my mission, I work with only two people and I've seen a lot of other missions doing that, the same thing. Yes, there are some missions that have not been able to uh, do things the way they were expected to do because they were, were overwhelmed, but there are missions that have worked a lot. And um, here, another thing I would like to say that a lot depends on the countries of destination as well, uh, how they are also cooperating with the missions. But at the end, if we put too much emphasis on the work of the and the responsibility of the mission, we are missing out one thing. We are putting all the emphasis on the responsibilities of countries of origin. But as I said at the very beginning that it needs to go. So we also have to see and talk about and emphasize on the role and the responsibility of countries of uh, destination, not only on the countries of origin. And I think um, uh, Faduk uh, Ahmed from Bangladesh mentioned one thing about uh, social issues. I'm very glad that you have mentioned it because if you remember uh, during the chairmanship of GFMD of Bangladesh, when Bangladesh was chairing GFMD, we included three sub themes. One was economy, one was governance, and very importantly, we also included the social issues and another sub theme. Now, lastly, to say, uh, you, you know that um, even the countries individually are doing a lot for the um, for the compensation of, of the uh, workers. I can say from Bangladesh, our Honorable Prime Minister has announced a specific, very specific fund for the expatriate Bangladesh. And we are already, we have already started having, handing over the funds for those who are going back, but also for those uh, who have uh, died during COVID and giving funds for their, uh, as compensation for their family members. So right. countries are in need, but we have our challenges as well. And we commit to work together to uh, fix those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think uh, those were very uh, interesting uh, responses. Uh, I have two more questions. We'll quickly uh, take them. And uh, one is from Mr. Om Prakash Manji. He is asking how the structure of health schemes in the countries, destination countries, has changed from pre-COVID times. Can someone? Because I don't know whom to address this question exactly. Can anyone, anyone uh, you know, volunteer uh, to respond to this? Please. 
uh, maybe I can try. Yeah, please go, uh, Smita uh, Krishna. Well, pre-COVID, pre um, I must say, example in Malaysia as a destination country, uh, migrants, uh, undocumented migrants, did not have access to uh, med medical. Uh, they had access to private medical if they were, they could afford it, but not to government medical. And um, documented workers were dependent on their uh, on were dependent on their employers for access to medical because they had to have insurance. And, and they, did, they had to have the uh, necessary paperwork from the, um, from the employers to seek medical, to, uh, uh, government medical. But uh, during the COVID, this changed because, um, of course, to contain the, the spread of the virus, uh, the medical system was open to everyone, uh, regardless of their, uh, of their undocumented status. So uh, undocumented workers as well as documented workers, everyone, had access free treatment as well as free screening in medical uh, facilities. Uh, so that was one of the good things that, uh, that was done in Malaysia. Of course, later, uh, we somehow or other, the government retracted that and began uh, um, detaining persons uh, who were coming for, who were, you know, uh, were under uh, a particular area, uh, a restricted area. So that was not a positive thing, but then prior to that, it was a good move to allow all uh, persons access to medical. So it's, it shows that it can be done. It shows that the, 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 the government can provide medical for everyone if it wanted to. So, so this is something that we should welcome. And, and I think the, the host country, as well as the country of origin, should work towards providing medical for all. Uh, the remittances that the, 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 the countries of origin obtain and the uh, levies that the countries of destination uh, uh, obtain from the migrant workers, that kind of benefit should be used to provide medical, uh, to provide benefits to the migrants themselves because the migrants are the ones who are bringing out this money. You know? so, so these are some of the funds that could be used for the benefits of the migrant. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... I uh, would like to ask the last uh, question. Uh, maybe uh, Ambassador Jay Surya or uh, MS Jose Noun could uh, respond to this. This is about what are the learning lessons for the sending states in the COVID-19 uh, uh, times? Uh, would you be, would, is Ambassador Jay Surya, uh, would you like to uh, respond, ma'am? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a very uh, pertinent uh, question for us to take home uh, following this unprecedented uh, scenario. Uh, as said very well, uh, we, we were prepared to uh, respond to normal time council issues, but uh, many missions were overwhelmed. But the positive side uh, of this whole uh, issue is that when the missions were collaborating with the help of all the stakeholders on the ground and uh, and on the destination countries, that there is some level of confidence being built and which we should be using uh, this aspect to respond to any future crisis that are to become. And for example, uh, in Sri Lanka, we had the Foreign Employment Bureau Fund, which was dedicated only uh, for those registered migrant workers. But with the COVID situation and then with the database developed, we realized that there were more undocumented irregular migrants. And then with the cabinet decision, uh, this fund was extended to those undocumented uh, or those who were irregular status. So these were uh, some of the uh, better uh, uh, coordination and also identifying the issues on the ground. And then one other uh, critical issue that has been discussed in this panel was about the migrant health. And we, uh, within uh, some of our regional forums, particularly in Colombo process, had tried to address this issue, but which didn't garner that much support and attention. So this particular unprecedented health crisis has given us an eye-opener why we should invest more on migrant health. And particularly the other aspect uh, in time to come after post-COVID, there will be more uh, economic uh, and related trade commerce issues which will be done on digital platforms. So 
we should as countries especially sending countries to be ready to uh, grapple with this new normal and and to prepare our workforce uh, to respond in such a manner one last point uh, about the female migrant workers which is very sensitive and we all as developing countries uh, we have our migrant women uh, mostly migrating uh, out of desperation uh, for economic needs uh, but then we also have to uh, better equip them through better training and also pre departure orientation uh, so that they will be not only uh, uh, skilled in uh, particular niche areas caretakers uh, or caregivers so that they will be able to get more uh, uh, defined wages and defined rights and the missions uh, will be able to protect their rights better so these were i think uh, some of the uh, lessons and also in the multilateral system we talked about the gcm uh, so now it is time for us to candidly look inward to see what has worked what has not worked and what would have worked better for us if we had certain uh, policies and guidelines and more forward looking collaboration so this is a time i think a challenge that as well as an opportunity for us to better reformulate transform our own responses thank you wonderful i think you have summed it well uh, time to see what has worked and what has not worked i think that actually uh, the tagline that should be the tagline uh, of the entire uh, webinar that we have had today uh, we have uh, uh, would, you, would you like to add anything uh, ms uh, josine noun please in case you have then we'll listen to you and otherwise we'll move to the uh, closing session quickly i think perhaps uh, madam is not around uh, we shall proceed uh, uh, let me uh, in the closing part 3 i would request the panelists to say in a minute's time uh, your own observations or what are the takeaways Uh, that uh, you know you think came from this particular webinar or anything else that you not said uh, a minute each uh, considering that we have uh, you know crossed uh, the time limit set for ourselves please can i uh, start uh, from uh, the reverse order uh, madam uh, samanta jaisurya in case you wish to add anything to what you have said if you don't have we can move also there is no issue Ah, uh, your uh, mic is off, ma'am. Can you put your put on your microphone? Ah, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think I I uh, tried to sum up thinking that it was my final comment. Uh, but I but I guess I I I want to say that we we take this challenge as an opportunity and uh, to see uh, what went wrong or what has worked and then build on as collectively and. at the same time there will be lot of best practices around us so it oh. is a time uh, bilaterally as well as multilaterally uh, to garner this and help ourselves uh, to look uh, for the future thank you thank you then uh, ms smita krishna uh, in case you wish to say anything in conclusion that we missed yes. so far yes i i just wanted to highlight one pertinent issue that has been a problem in in uh, Malaysia and for migrants here is that uh, migrants who wish to return back to their home countries uh, are required to go through a covid test a mandatory covid test and quite a number of the um, sending countries are imposing the test not all just some but uh, the problem here is the cost of that covid test is extremely expensive uh, it's almost about 80 to 90 usd and for a migrant worker it's a, it's a very um, large sum of money to pay uh, especially since they don't have they have not been working for 3 months prior to their departure or or even for tourists who haven't been uh, who have been uh, been stranded here and just about for everyone who has not been able to to go back so imposing that kind of uh, uh, you know requirement i think it may be a little bit counterproductive so so and especially when we don't have enough test kits in the country to provide for everyone 
so I think that the the country of uh, the sending no, country needs to relook at this policy to ensure that you need to take back your migrants who want to go back, but uh, not impose uh, this kind of restriction. It's, it's I think it's being it's, it's not really working out that well for migrants here who want to return. Thank you. All right, right, very valid point, uh, Manish Gupta. So very quickly, I will just touch upon four points which I feel. The first point, I think the important lesson is we need to draw the right lessons for the governance of migration. We need to work together with the destination countries and also recognize this is always going to be a slow moving process. We will have incremental outcomes, but nonetheless, you must continue to insist on it. Second point, in our respective frameworks, we need to prioritize the most vulnerable. It's very easy to set them down, but it really requires a strong political will, a lot of work on the part of the foreign offices also. In the Indian case, the Indian Community Welfare Fund has worked exceedingly well. But then I must really thank, you know, the political will that was there in our system to put, put it off the mark the way we wanted it to be. The third point we need to focus on using the technology and the social media. Many a times, you know, we, those who are in the bureaucracy, they think technology is very, very, very different, and very challenging animal. It's not like that. Each one of us in the missions, consulates, within the ministry, we can use it for our own benefit. It will be helpful in building up the databases and registering the skilling set of migrants, which will can be put to better use. And lastly, we must continue to reform and improve our systems. Feedback is exceedingly important. All the community organizations, the workers who are rep being represented here, please continue to share your feedback with us. And the last request, please slightly be patient. All the missions, consulates, wherever in which part of the world, the governments, they take your feedback seriously and they work on it. Thank you. Thank you. I think very important uh, points, uh, including we have to be patient. Uh, yes. Uh, can I request Thomas Matthew to conclude, uh, he, you know, his own observations? Uh, and if is there is there anything left? A minute, please, sir. Uh, your microphone is not on. Yes. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll put everything in one or two points. Uh, one is uh, uh, that in this crisis conditions, this is a global crisis condition. Uh, there was a Mickey uh, initiative, migrants in countries in uh, crisis. Uh, there is an initiative under the UN and there is a report also. But uh, the countries failed or the UN failed to implement these kind of things uh, 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 prior to that one. So at least now on, we have to see that these kind of initiative report and, and the reports, because I attended some of these conferences and there is a, a report is there. So we have to see that uh, this make it initiative is uh, taken care of and it is uh, 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 put into practice by the, all the missions uh, throughout the world. Then some uh, this kind of crisis conditions can be overcome. This is one point. The other thing is that the uh, there is a ICW fund. There is an Indian Community Welfare Fund is there. There is a huge fund is there. There is a political will is lagging. I am talking about India. There is a political. This is the money which we are given. We have given to the distressed people to take care of them. Why the government of India is not giving directives uh, to the embassies to make use of this one? The distressed people are there. In this condition, why it is not uh, given? This is one point I wanted to uh, ask to the Indian uh, Indian uh, uh, authorities. This is uh, one thing. And also, uh, the em embassies are shying uh, to work with the uh, civil society organizations. More than the embassies, many of these uh, field, uh, the uh, civil society organizations uh, have worked and they have done a lot of work. And they're, they're the, the small and large scale work they, they, they were doing. Even the, uh, even the uh, repatriation, even the uh, giving food and other, all, all, all kinds of uh, facilities, these civil society organizations were in the forefront. But they are not at all recognized or a coordinated work was missing. And that is why the, the, an effective, effective way of uh, doing uh, the, uh, the treat, uh, to, to, uh, to fighting the crisis, uh, we failed. If we failed, we can say. 
That's all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think from my, from my personal experience, I can say that the ICWF funds are mostly uh, at the discretion of ambassador with the certain limits. Uh, but anyway, this is a point of uh, technical information which can be sought from uh, Minister of External Affairs. Uh, sir, I, one one thing I, I can tell, I, I want, let me add, I mean, sorry. Uh, this, uh, we have taken a court order, a court order to, to say that this fund is to be utilized. We have taken. Same, 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 similar thing has happened with the amnesty in, in Kuwait. I have to go to, I have written to the Prime Minister, the Ambassador, the Ministers, everything. Nothing ha happened. But I, have to, I was forced to go to the Supreme Court to get a directive. And after that only the government started acting and the repatriation process was done for the amnesty, amnesty people here in Kuwait. So this is, sorry, it's a political right. thing. Lacking. Okay. I, I do appreciate your point that the, sometimes the policy decisions uh, in the uh, you know head uh, in a home foreign ministry it does take time, and the you know embassies are put uh, sometimes at some awkward position. But anyway, uh, thank you for making that point. Uh, I will request before I request the last uh, panelist to speak, uh, Ms. Elena uh, Sana, who is from uh, to give us perspective from the Philippine. Uh, point of view about uh, this uh, thing and then in the end I will request uh, our ambassador Nashida uh, Sobham uh, to have so-called the last word. Uh, is is uh, Ms. Elena Sana is around? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you sir. Yeah, so I think uh, just to iterate the point that for countries like the Philippines, we do not have enough number of embassies for to cover all our people. Like we are in 238 countries and we only have like 18 embassies, functionaries and much less number of labor offices. So I think the point is, and this is mentioned several times already during the discussion, we need to, we need to really strengthen cooperation and collaboration with, with our um, uh, counterpart missions from other countries of origin. At the same time, uh, and, and making uh, exchanges of information and uh, best practices. So, for example, how do you combat trafficking and how do you get rid of unscrupulous recruiters and employers even? You share the information. You are we're all working. Our migrant workers are working in one destination and the recruiters in those destination countries will be going to all our countries so you have the information and i think it would be very good it would serve the interest of all our migrant workers we will be sharing this information that we have as per our experiences of course it's been mentioned already many times especially by, by our uh, by thomas the need to also give recognition <coughs> to the community the migrant community the diaspora community that always rise up especially in public emergencies, public health emergencies such as this pandemic. And I think it's only like uh, proper that we accord them not only the recognition, but also the respect that you are indeed our partners, not only in times of need, but also that, you know, make it real and providing them uh, uh, slots or, or, or voices in, in, in policy making, in consultations, that they should be given the voice what, uh, to, to be consulted directly. I think it's quite important to do that, not only in the countries of origin, but especially also in the countries of destination and the missions can facilitate those spaces for the migrants and for the organizations of migrants. Definitely, I think at the end of the day, especially in pandemics such as this one, we need to, to look after not only of our own migrant workers, but of all the migrant workers negotiating with the countries of destination, if we need to, to, to get visas so our workers will have to be repatriated and those things, we need the nations to do that. Especially in the Gulf where, country, where, where migrant organizations have very limited access directly, direct access to the host governments. We need the nations to facilitate those, those things so that our workers will be less burdened, especially in this time. I think that's all I wanted to say, and thank you so much for this Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry uh, for a very uh, little time we could give you, but uh, we are about to conclude now. So 
Last word, uh, Ambassador Nashida Subhan, Excellency. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mulek. Um, I would like to um, focus on three things which I uh, previously mentioned, except for one. Uh, one is about uh, the uh, cooperation, the partnership at the regional level as well as the global level. In the regional level, it has to be within the countries of uh, origin, but also engaging with the countries of destination. So at the regional level, partnership and cooperation, and also international level partnership and cooperation. And the role of UN has to be emphasized because that's where we always count on. I, I still believe in multilateralism because I have spent most of my career time in multilateralism, so I still believe in it, but it has to be reinvigorated. And one thing is missing from UN is their engagement on migration and migrants issues. Uh, here, I would say at the global level, yes, political will is one thing that needs to be emphasized and we need to look into it. Secondly, one thing I, uh, I think we have discussed about a lot of things, but one thing is missing from our discussion, which I would like to add, it is the responsibility of the migrants themselves. Uh, their responsibility in engaging with the embassy and in, in, in engaging with the, um, with the missions work and also cooperating with the mission and also about their status in every uh, countries of destination. And uh, lastly, uh, which I, I have also mentioned about, like uh, at the very beginning, I, I talked about uh, the scope of MIKIC. We need to take a look into it. If it doesn't work, then we need to probably think about uh, a similar kind of uh, mechanism whereby we can address the situation of mi migrants, particularly destitute and vulnerable migrants in the uh, times of crisis. And there I would say that we need to really come up with uh, something, some kind of mechanism in whatever uh, form it is uh, in a very short period of time. We cannot have something like uh, two years of discussion or negotiation to come up with that kind of uh, mechanism. But, and it has to be uh, like, we, we cannot wait for another crisis to come and uh, you know then we have this kind of mechanism. It is of urgency that we talk about it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, you really summed up well. Uh, now it's uh, thank you, the panelists, and uh, now I come to the closing. Uh, since the time is very, very short, I'll just, rather than going in details, I'll wrap up by mentioning the points that have emerged. We can call them takeaway or uh, conclusion, uh, concluding points. Uh, we need to have short term, medium term, and long term thinking on, on this and plan. That's number one. Number two would be, uh, you know, there has to be a better coordination among various stakeholders. Uh, somebody mentioned PPP mode, uh, civil society organizations and the prominent role to them. Just now you, you mentioned about the responsibilities of the migrant workers themselves. They should be, of course, at the center of this debate uh, and this discourse. Uh, next one is the regional multilateral uh, and international organizations. They have to be much, much more uh, proactive uh, in this and including UN, you said, you said UN, but I see in the 17, uh, you know, SDGs, there's no specific provision about labor or workers, if I remember them correctly. Uh, next is the information infrastructure. We call it in various uh, ways, but information gaps uh, have to be filled in at various uh, places whether it is uh, you know, data about uh, who, those who want to return, uh, whether it is uh, skill mapping that has to uh, take place, you know, all kinds of, because this data will be ultimately very useful to every stakeholder. Next one, these are not necessarily in order of uh, priority. Uh, next one is the uh, women, uh, uh, you know, vulnerability about, uh, you know, particularly and a focus uh, and a separate approach to deal with the problems that the women workers face abroad. Uh, next is, uh, you know, SOPs, best practices, political will. I, I would, you know, I'll put them in one uh, set because without political will, nothing can move. There has to be very, uh, you know, fast and very uh, strong decisions at the headquarters. And for that political will has to be uh, very much uh, there. Uh, Communication and coordination is uh, you know, other issue uh, that uh, needs to be uh, addressed very, very seriously. Uh, we have to focus on undocumented workers because again, this is a different 
set of uh, workers who need special attention. Uh, highlighting the role of host governments at destination countries, because I think what have they done, what they can do, and you know how how can it be a stronger partnership at local level bilaterally between the missions uh, and uh, the host governments. I think that's an important point uh, that we need to uh, really uh, look at. Uh, someone mentioned a very important point about the coordination among the missions. There has to be more interaction and exchange of views, uh, you know, among various missions at the destination uh, countries, because that will help us uh, in getting to know what is happening uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, handling of these uh, workers. Uh, strong networks, network of st uh, stakeholders, we discussed that. Uh, empowering the missions in terms of human resources, in terms of manpower, in terms of, you know, uh, equipments uh, related, uh, which will help them in better communication, faster communications. So in terms of resources to be made available to the missions, empowering, uh, Thomas Matthew mentioned about the role of, uh, you know, the welfare funds and how they are utilized. And last but not the least is return of workers. Uh, and, uh, you know, there has to be a very uh, different set of uh, approaches or strategies or measurements that handles uh, the returning because uh, I don't see, because in India, the responsibility is with the states and the states are not often proactive in taking up uh, these issues. Uh, lastly, which is not directly related to the, this thing, but again, a very important and somebody did touch upon it is the uh, human policies or human approach uh, of the missions. We have to be sensitive. Uh, to the vulnerabilities, we have to be compassionate uh, as missions, uh, then only we'll be able to, you know, extend the, the necessary assistance and help. I uh, really rest my case there. I would like to thank uh, the experts. I'd also like to uh, thank the participants, panelists, for a wonderful and very vibrant uh, discussion, if I may describe it in, uh, you know, those adjectives. Uh, thank you very much. I would now request uh, Ms. Rola Amati from the Cross Regional Center for Refugees and Migrants uh, to give her concluding uh, remarks and close uh, with a vote of thanks uh, to uh, you know everybody uh, present here. I would like to thank personally Mr. William Goy, uh, Dr. Sadanand Sahu, uh, Ms. Rola Amati, and Mr. Shabri Nair uh, of Ireland. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mule. Um, it's been a very rich discussion today on, on missions and the role of missions. Um, in a very difficult migration journey, oftentimes missions are the home away from home. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we still see many migrant workers being turned away at the doors of missions. This webinar has been really a very rich discussion on uh, going further, a step further, and really realizing what missions could be, the potentials of missions, of being more inclusive and more responsive of migrant needs, uh, more responsive of documented workers, more responsive of undocumented workers, women migrant workers, all of the employment problems that we talked about um, today. We hope that this conversation does not end here today. We hope that this is something that we will continue to take forward. Um, and we hope that this will continue with all of the people that were here today. On behalf of the uh, Cross Region Center for Refugees and Migrants, Migrant Forum in Asia, and the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism, we would like to thank our six panelists who did an amazing job today. We would like to thank uh, Ambassador Samantha Jayasuriya, Ambassador Nahida Subhan, um, Consul General Manish Gupta, Thomas Matthew, uh, Sumita Krishna, and Josian Noon for their wonderful contributions today. And also a big, big thank you uh, for you, Ambassador Moulet, for leading us in this discussion and leading us in the preparations as well. And we hope that you will continue to lead us going forward in the follow-up work that we hope that will come out of this webinar. So on behalf of the organizer, we thank you all. We thank all the participants that have participated and we also thank the team that was behind uh, making this possible. Thanks everyone and have a good day. <coughs> Thank you, Allah.
thank you very much thank you thank you thank you take care and all the best take care of your health yeah. particularly in these difficult times mm -hmm. so we can at least continue to speak on <laughs>